applying to RADA was the first step in an acknowledgement to myself that I was going to be an actor. Um, and um, I think I'd always wanted to do it, but I'd never allowed myself to um, admit it, to be quite honest. And so all through my childhood, my teenage, my adolescence, people have said, what do you want to be? And I'd say, well, you know, I'll just work it out when I get there. And, and um, I'd never, I think I'd never even admitted it to myself, which is a strange thing. So coming here was kind of a big, big deal for me. And I think I remember sitting in this room and, and Patricia Myers, Pat, the registrar saying, you know, it's going to be a long, tough, bumpy road and some of you will make it, some of you won't. And just so you know, it's a big world and a big industry and there's lots of ways of, of being involved. It doesn't have to be acting if it doesn't work out. I remember thinking, well, I'm not going to be one of those guys, <laughs> probably hubristically, but just thinking, I really need, this really needs to work, you know. I think because, because the, the, um, the business of of um, being an actor because the industry and it all moves so fast now that I tend I tend to be unconscious of my training in a way that I think is very useful um, and I think initially when I left I was very conscious of different techniques and different processes and different um, methodologies and, and ways into character ways of stagecraft character craft you know um, different shades of the truth. And then as I got more and more into sort of just the nuts and bolts of working, um, it's almost as if I forgot about it and it became unconscious. A bit like driving a car is when you're first driving, you're, you're aware of, of the lessons that you've learned, the mirror signal maneuver and the gear st you know, shift stick and, and it all become, it's all slightly, um, you're watching yourself doing it. Does that make sense? But then after a while, there's an, it becomes automatic and you just know how to drive. And now I think um, my training has kind of reduced um, and um, a bit like a sort of, um, like a recipe or something, like a, um, like a stew into something, that, into something that I would simply call my actor's instinct. So that, so that the only thing that I feel that sort of, that I use as an actor is um, my instinct. If I read a script, um, I see a character, uh, I read a scene, I'm in a scene, and whether it's on stage or on film or on television, the first response to how a part should be played or how a scene should be played is an instinctive one. And as I listen to that very, very carefully, almost before I hear an external opinion, a director's opinion, a producer's opinion. Um, I make sure I know how instinctively I think the, what the truth of the moment is. And, and I suppose what I'm saying is that that instinct has been informed, supplemented and backed up by my training in a way that is now unconscious. Um, I think one of the things that struck me is how complete I think it is. Um, especially as, as a um, as a school that teaches craft in a way and by, by completeness I mean um, there's, a, there's emphasis on acting sort of method as in um, sort of different ways of getting into character expanding yourself into an imaginary situation um, using you know this, the reduced techniques of Stanislavski and Meisner and uh, Lab and, and all these different ways in, but also very simple craftsmanship about keeping your voice in good shape, um, keeping your body in good shape. And I don't mean just going to the gym and getting buff, but, but being limber and ready to perform, you know, having, having a, an instrument that's, that's playable um, uh, and knowing how to keep it in tune and not necessarily like keep it really finely tuned, but keep it balanced so that nothing, nothing surprises you. You're fit enough to do things that are required. You're fit enough to do 90 performances in a run of the West End of a big five act Shakespeare play. You're fit enough to say to a stunt director on a film, yep, yeah, I can do that. Um, and there is a, 
a sense, you're fit enough to, or agile enough to learn a song in two days. Um, or, um, or for example, do a green screen on a big film, which, which is, you know, as an actor, you're having to stand in a studio with the pressure of producers behind a curtain like The Wizard of Oz, with all the money going, ah, he, he better be good. And, um, and all that keeps you safe is your imagination. You know, I don't know, for example, if anyone has seen um, uh, the films I've made with Marvel, like uh, Thor or The Avengers, um, those films are, are kind of cut and pasted um, like, a, like a sort of thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And often, many of the things that I'm responding to in character as Loki are, are supplied by visual effects after the event. So quite often, um, I'm in a situation where um, I'm having, I'm in dialogue with thin air. I'm looking at, um, or I'm reacting to an explosion, or a monster, or a spaceship, or an alien. Um, or, or some kind of cataclysmic dramatic event which is not in fact happening in front of me. Therefore, um, there, I have no um, external stimulus to respond to and I'm having to supply um, the event in my mind and respond to it in, in my imagination as if it were happening. That's no different from stagecraft. Uh, you know, if you're performing um, The Three Sisters in the West End, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't take a great degree of intelligence to point out that you are not in fact in Russia and you are imagining you are in Russia and the whole thing is, is an imagined event. Um, and uh, I suppose the things that I learned, I, I remember one day, you know, in a scene with the Incredible Hulk where there was no Incredible Hulk opposite me, there was just a piece of coloured sellotape um, taped to a, um, a metal sea stand and having to scream um, at the Hulk as if there was a Hulk there and, and, um, and, then, and then I was swept out of shot and there were wires attached to my legs and I remember thinking this is no different from a class at RADA where um, you know it's we're really learning clowning technique and you're having to improvise that you know that it's raining and you're having to put up your umbrella and that suddenly you're very cold and there are all these things that are happening in the story but aren't actually happening you're just in a white box it just happens to be a green box and there are cameras recording what you're doing um, so it's interesting how the world has changed because in some filming situations you really don't need to your imagination is redundant because you're really in a situation for example uh, when I was uh, when we were filming War Horse I was really on a horse, um, surrounded by a hundred other horses in formation, charging at 40 miles an hour across an open field, and there was a, a camera on a truck that I was chasing. No acting required. Just ride the horse, you know? Um, nothing, you know, the only thing my imagination had to supply was, was uh, rows upon rows of German machine guns with real bullets on the other side. But the rest of it, the 40 miles an hour, the horses, the hooves, the wind, the uniforms, a hundred stuntmen crying hell fury, that's real. And in a way, the, the thrill of being in that situation is you simply have to inhabit the reality. Um, but of course, it's, you know, every job is different, so then you suddenly find yourself in a green screen world where you're uh, you know, flying through the streets of New York on, a, on an alien spacecraft, and actually you're on a kind of raised uh, dodger bumper car in a fairground that's being uh, mechanically moved by hydraulic pipes underneath you and there's a big fan in front of your face and nothing is real and you're having to supply the real responses with your imagination and that for me I have found is where the discipline of having trained kicks in uh, and that I have a very real experience that I can draw upon to go I oh, guess I sort of know what this is um, and part of it is is actually the experience of letting go of your self-consciousness and and in so many ways acting can be reduced to being unafraid of looking like a fool because if you were really there on set with me 
watching me howling at the wind in the middle of a sound stage in <laughs> the desert of New Mexico. I look like a madman. Um, and in fact, I probably am. But uh, it's, it's sort of part of the job is that you're not afraid to look like an idiot um, because on screen it looks fantastic. One, one hopes. I, you know, I think one thing that Rada does very, very well is it offers a kind of, um, like a buffet of, of, uh, of, of different techniques, which, you know, we, and we, we all have different tastes. So, and I had an amazing year of people who have all done extremely well, um, like Andrea Riseborough and Andrew Buchan, um, Amanda Hale. And uh, I know Andrea, you know, it, it has a different, and because I've been worked together since, her, she has a very specific process and a, a specific way into character, which started, she started to develop while she was here. But I wouldn't say it was similar to mine, or the same as mine in a way, even though we were at the same, we were here at the same time and had the same training on offer. So um, one of the things I've taken more than anything is, is um, I remember thinking before I came that I was lucky enough to have had a, you know, a, a, form, a very formal education by going to Cambridge and getting a degree and reading lots of books and doing a lot of thinking and a lot of writing and suddenly coming to RADA and being around people who've done a lot less writing and reading and a lot more acting um, and, but who were vocally and physically fitter than me. You know, I'd sat in a lot of libraries <laughs> and I could probably write a lot of essays about Shakespeare and Chekhov and Ibsen but maybe they, they didn't know so much about the dramaturgical structure of it. They didn't maybe, they hadn't read so much, you know, Euripides and Sophocles in original Greek like I had, but they knew how to say it and sing it. And they had the kind of, they had the body and the balls for it in a way. Um, and, and that was a, a bit of a wake up call for me. And I, I, I remember coming to RADA with a sort of private remit about vocal and physical training. And um, it's a strange thing is you can, you can understand the play till the cows come home, but unless you kind of physically and emotionally commit to it, then you'll never be able to perform it. And um, so the classes I loved in a way were the ones where I wasn't thinking, where it was about action. Um, and I don't mean action in a sort of Hollywood sense. I mean, it was about movement and about sort of getting out of your head and about um, trying stuff out. And uh, I loved the movement stuff but because it wasn't, it's hard to put my finger on it, but it wasn't just about being fit, even though um, kind of aerobic fitness was required and you kind of got that as a, as a, as a side effect, but it was about being open and, and um, prepared and ready. The craft of acting has stayed the same. So it, it, that I think is why training is so important because there's really only one, not there's a million ways to do it, but there's only one way it can be done properly, which is a synthesis of brain, body and heart. And I think training is really important for that. I think I certainly feel that um, it's really interesting that, it, that there's an enormous respect for RADA out in the world. Um, I don't think many people really have any idea what goes on here in terms of the actual process. It's almost become like a brand in the best sense, but we live in a very branded world um, and people trust that. People trust in branding and they trust in the power of particular brands um, that certain things will deliver quality on a particular level. And I certainly feel that sort of having a, a rada, you know, rada on my lapel, as it were, has been something that people have respected, even though they don't quite know what goes on here. Um, uh, and that's, I'd say, I'd say fairly global. Um, you know, you're, if you're working in Los Angeles, you know, um, in the movies and, and people, there's a great respect for training. Um, certainly that, you know, British actors are constantly working in America, constantly working in television and film because they're well trained. And in a way there is a, there is a tradition of, of um, seriousness, even though we don't take ourselves too seriously, but at least a seriousness of commitment to professionalism. When you, when you work with people who are very, very good at um, 
knowing quality when they see it, i.e. they're, they're kind of um, product driven and, the, and when something works, they're very good at, 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 at recognizing it, packaging it and sending it out there. What they're less good at is helping you make it and understanding that it's a sort of, it's like a kind of um, a golden ticket that I got being trained because when I'm faced with this new script or whatever, a new character and it all seems completely off the wall, I have a, I have a set of, they are abstract because they're in my mind, but they're, it's a set of tools where I can make something out of nothing. And then they can go, oh, you really know how to do this. And I go, well, you know, I, I, none of us really do. And we're all we're trying to, it's, we're sort of lightning rods for, for um, you know, energy, for experience. And, you know, all actors are trying to do is, is, is mirror experience, usually, hopefully, through good writing. You know, writers who have taken an idea, taken a story, taken a group of characters and spun something that resembles something powerful, moving, funny about being alive. And actors are, are giving breath of life to that. And it's, you know, the funny thing about acting is it's very hard to put your finger on what, what it is. Is it, it's all, it's an interpretive art. It's not, there's no, we're not like painters. We don't have a canvas. We don't have clay. We don't have pots and paints. We don't have even a pen. Um, we just have this, you know, arms, legs, voice, eyes, and um, our organs and our feelings and it's trying to to find a way of being a professional that you can harness you know all of those essentially simple tools and create something out of nothing which is then recognized by people who work in marketing and finance and production as something that is of value in a way and of artistic value even though no one can quite put their finger on why or what it is. And, um, you know, everyone has different tastes. Some people um, think that there are certain actors who are, you know, the greatest actors in the world and other people, you know, can't stand them because they're, it's too much or it's too little or I just don't like his vibe or whatever. You know, it's an ephemeral, mysterious thing. But I think training, training at least gives you something to fall back on when you're lost or... I don't know, it's, the reason is it's hard for me to put my finger on it. But I think that's a good thing. And it's an experience that I went through. I mean, the other thing that happened at RADA was it really tested my commitment. I mean, it made me realize how, how challenging um, the job is sometimes, how draining it can be, especially if you're playing a very intense role or, or you know, um, or, or, or digging around in a play that's about very intense feelings. And, and being here for three years and paying for it as opposed to being paid for it makes you question why you're doing it and, and, and why you love it. And, and that changes all the time. It keeps changing the longer I work. You know, it's like, what do I really want to do with this? I have, you know, this, this is what I've chosen to do. And, um, how do I want to make people feel? You know, what kind of work do I want to do? And, and RADA starts that process of questioning, you know, like it helps you believe in your value as an artist, even though in this country that's kind of a dirty word and calling yourself an artist can seem a bit pretentious. But nevertheless, actors are artists with, um, you know, with, with something to express. So it, it, in a, just the experience of having gone through all of these tests of my commitment, you know, not really being able to sing, um, uh, having an academic training, but, but no vocal or physical training, um, having never done yoga before and coming away with yoga being a, a basic, it's like brushing my teeth now, you know, keeping limber. Every director I work with on stage or on film, there's always something new I've never done. There's always something different I haven't tried. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing is, that I understood here is that lots of people told me when I got here, this is just the beginning. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're going to leave RADA and be done. It's not, not, it's like, it's not over. It's, you're still going to keep learning, keep learning, keep learning, keep refining, keep reducing. Um, and of course, as, as, as any human being grows up and gains new experiences, then you'll, and then 
your work changes and you know if, if you can think of I can think of um, uh, you know Peter O'Toole as an old man it's different from Peter O'Toole as a young man um, same is true of, 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 of our best theatre actors you think of um, uh, Vanessa Redgrave now mm-hmm. and the actress that she is and think of the actress that she used to be um, when she started or Judy Dench you know some Judy Dench has famously talked about um, who you know her her sort of early beginnings and her lack of confidence and and being slated for her first Ophelia at the old Vic and now she is sort of the great emblem of of of, of British acting um, so it's good to come to somewhere and to know that it's 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 you know even when you graduate you've only got to base camp you know you're nowhere near the summit yet and you keep climbing base camp is good like yeah. don't get me wrong yeah. you don't you know to get to base camp you've had to do a lot of work yeah. but it's the it's the beginning it's always it seems like I always still feel like I'm at the beginning and there's things I don't know things I haven't done um, still trying to get sharper realer more truthful more simple you know, it's, it's never, the work is never done.